Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, your friendly guide to the English language. We talk about writing, history, rules, and other cool stuff. But before we jump into this week's podcast, I have not one, but two pronunciation corrections. First, when I was telling my story about the NATO phonetic alphabet, the segment that keeps on giving, I gave the example of N as Neanderthal, and then learned from a number of kind and amusing listeners that I have been pronouncing that word wrong my whole life. I said Neanderthal, but it is actually pronounced Neanderthal, or even Neanderthal, which is the first pronunciation at the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary and an alternative pronunciation at dictionary.com, but sounds very strange to me. I'm going to try to say it Neanderthal from now on. The origin of the word is kind of interesting, too. The name comes from the Neander Valley in Germany, where remains that were later called Neanderthals were discovered. But what's cool is that Neander means new man, and Neanderthals were essentially a new kind of man, a human species, but different from our own. But that name is just a coincidence. According to Edam Online, the Neander Valley is named after Joachim Neumann, a German pastor who loved visiting this valley in the 1670s. Neander is a Greek interpretation of Newman, apparently because it was common at the time for educated Germans to adopt classical forms of their surnames, getting all fancy with the Greek. But what a coincidence. Second, my O as in the orangutan example also had a pronunciation problem. I pronounce the word orangutan, but if you look at the spelling, there is no G at the end. Again, in this case, Merriam-Webster and Dictionary.com disagree about which pronunciation comes first and which is an alternative. But in this case, at least my pronunciation is one of those actually listed. It can be pronounced either the way I say it, orangutan or orangutan. Next, I have one big meaty middle about why English has so many silent letters. The English spelling system is famous for not making sense. The phonetic ideal of having each letter represent exactly one sound, and each sound represented by exactly one letter, is impossible when English has about 45 sounds or phonemes and only 26 letters to represent them. But more than that, any language that's been written for a long enough time will have spellings that haven't caught up with the modern pronunciations, because pronunciations change. English has been written for about 1,300 years, which is plenty of time for these mismatches to accumulate. One of the most frustrating signs of these spelling mismatches is English's abundance of silent letters. With a conservative definition of silent letter, more than half of the letters of our alphabet are silent in at least some words. Today, we'll find out the stories behind some of these silent letters. We're mostly going to talk about silent consonant letters, but we can't talk about silent letters without acknowledging the most famous silent letter in English, the silent E. Some silent letters appear in just a few words, but silent E appears so regularly that there's even a spelling rule about it. A silent E at the end of a word makes the preceding vowel long. A long vowel sounds like its name like the A in the word name, and a short vowel sounds weaker, like the A in the word car. Long A, short A. According to the Cambridge Encyclopedia of the English Language by David Crystal, this rule has its origins in the early part of the Middle English period, in other words, in the 11th century. In those days, English used suffixes much more than it does now to show if a word was singular or plural, or if it was being used as the subject or object of a sentence. For example, hus, spelled H-U-S, meant just house, but husa, spelled H-U-S-E, meant to a house. However, in the Middle English period, that final a sound got dropped completely so that whether the word was spelled H-U-S or H-U-S-E, it was pronounced hoose. Still, that didn't stop people from writing the final E. As Crystal writes, quote, Although the final a uh sound disappeared, 
the E's spelling remained, and it gradually came to be used to show that the preceding vowel was a long. This is the origin of the modern spelling rule about silent E in words such as name and rose. Many silent consonant letters represent consonants that were actually pronounced at one time, but fell victim to changing phonotactic rules. Well, what's a phonotactic rule? It's a rule that describes the way sounds can be arranged in the words of a language. For example, one phonotactic rule of present-day English is that you don't have a long U sound before the NG sound. So although ring, rang, and rung are all good English words, rung is not only not an English word, it's not even a possible English word. One phonotactic rule that changed has to do with where you can have an H sound. Say the word hug. It begins with the H sound, right? Now say the word huge. What sound does it begin with? H again? Well, yes and no. It's true that we hear it as an H, but it's not the same kind of H that we have in hug. That H is made by just letting air flow past your vocal cords down in your neck. The H in huge, though, is made by raising the body of your tongue up close to your palate and forcing air through that constriction. In present-day English, we only pronounce H at the beginning of words, but in Old English, the H pronounced with your tongue close to your palate could also appear in the middle of a word or at the end. It was spelled as an H in Old English and as G-H in Middle English. And even after English speakers stopped pronouncing those palatal H's, the spelling remained. We know it today as the silent G-H in words such as thought, night, and through. Phonotactic rules also deal with consonant clusters. And in English, these rules are pretty picky. With 23 consonant sounds, more than 500 consonant clusters are possible, but English uses only about 40, and some of those appear only in proper nouns, such as Gwen, or in borrowed words like schlep and sriracha. But in the past, English used to have quite a few more consonant clusters than it does now. One cluster that's disappeared is K-N, which gives us the silent K in words such as knife, knee, and knowledge. Knife, for example, used to be pronounced kanif. Another long-lost cluster is wr, which has given way to the silent w in words such as wrong, wreath, and wrestle. Yet another consonant cluster that English doesn't have anymore is gn, which is the source of the silent g in words such as gnaw, gnat, and gnarly. The word gnome also comes to mind when you think of silent G, but that's not from Old English. It's from Greek, which brings us to another source of silent letters. Classical Greek allowed several other consonant clusters that violate modern English phonotactic rules. As a result, Greek borrowings that begin with these clusters get simplified by losing that first consonant. In addition to the GN cluster of gnome and gnostic, Greek had several clusters beginning with P. The cluster PN appears in pneumonia and PS in words such as psalm and psychiatry. The cluster PT shows up in the root PTER, which means wing, in words such as pterodactyl. This word root PTER brings us to the phenomenon of silent letters that are magically revealed in the right phonetic situations. Notice that we pronounce the P with no problem at all when it has a vowel before it, in words such as helicopter and lepidoptera, the scientific name for the order of butterflies. What's happened is that the PT cluster has been split apart. The P ends up at the end of a syllable, cop or dop to be specific, and the T ends up at the beginning of the syllable, T-E-R. The same thing happens with the Greek root M-N-E-M, meaning mind. The M is silent in mnemonic, but in the word amnesia, it gets pronounced as the end of the syllable am. All the clusters we've talked about so far come at the beginning of a word, but there are also phonotactic rules about clusters coming at the end of a word. 
The word hymn, as in a hymn that you sing in church, has a silent N at the end of it. But like the disappearing, reappearing P and M, it gets revealed in the right phonetic environment. In this case, when it's followed by a vowel in the word hymnal. Latin provides a few of these, now you hear them, now you don't, ends too, in words such as condemn and condemnation. In the original Latin and Greek, these words had suffixes followed by those consonant clusters, but those suffixes got deleted when these words entered English, leaving a phonotactically unacceptable cluster at the ends of the words, thus giving us the silent N at the end. Some letters are silent in English because we borrowed the words from another language, and they're silent in that language, too. I'm looking at you, French. How many of you, like me, went for years hearing the word rendezvous spoken and not realizing it was the same word as rendez vous that you'd read in books? The rendez and the vous have a silent Z and silent S, respectively, because that's how they're pronounced in French. The same goes for the silent P and silent T in coup d'etat, and the silent D and silent X in Grand Prix. Why does French have so many silent final consonant letters? Well, just as in English, the spellings have been fixed for a long time and haven't changed with the language's pronunciation. As for why French speakers stopped pronouncing those final consonants in so many words, well, that's a question for the historical linguists. In case you're curious, though, the name for the deletion of sounds from the end of a word is apocope. And by the way, watch out when you're pronouncing French words, because not all of its final consonant letters are silent. Further, if a French word ends with a consonant followed by an E, you do pronounce that consonant. So a complete meal at a restaurant that's served at a fixed price is a prefix meal, because pre is P-R-I-X, while fix is spelled F-I-X-E. It's not a pre-fee meal, as I've heard some servers call it. And the finishing touch on a job is the coup de grace, because grace is spelled G-R-A-C-E. It's not coup de gras, which literally means a strike of fat. The last group of silent letters we'll talk about came from some misguided spelling reforms. We've been talking about how silent letters can result from not removing a letter that represents a sound that isn't pronounced. However, in some cases, a silent letter has come from putting in a letter for a sound that isn't pronounced. Why would anyone do such a thing? Well, as is often the case, someone had good intentions. In his book, The Fight for English, David Crystal explains that during the Renaissance, some spelling reformers thought it would be a good idea to insert letters to make a word's origin clear. This is where the silent B in debt came from. At the time, the word was spelled without a B, but reformers began to insert it to show its relation to the Latin source debitum. Crystal writes that this tinkering also resulted in the silent S in island, because the reformers were sure that this word came from the Latin word for island, insula. The joke was on them, though, because it didn't. Crystal concludes, quote, There are many more such cases. Some people nowadays find it hard to understand why there are so many silent letters of this kind in English. It's because other people thought they were helping, unquote. There are many other silent letters with stories that didn't make it into today's episode. The main thing to take away is that usually there's a good historical reason for a silent letter. Spelling reforms have often been proposed, and sometimes they've even been executed. For an example, you can read about Noah Webster in the Grammar Daily, or hear the story of the two spellings of color in episode 671. Even if we reformed spelling again now, we wouldn't solve the problem. In another hundred years, English pronunciations will have changed again. That segment was written by Neil Whitman, an independent writer and consultant specializing in language and grammar, and a member of the Reynoldsburg, Ohio, school board. You can search for him by name on Facebook or find him at his blog, literalminded.wordpress.com. Finally, I have a family act story. 
Hi, uh, I have a familect. My name is Fred Kerr, calling from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Longtime listener, first time caller. And my familect has to do with uh, the pandemic. As you know, as everybody knows, during the pandemic, everybody was stuck at home working in front of the computer. So you didn't have to put on real work clothes. But you couldn't really stay all day in your pajamas and be in front of your computer in like whatever it is that you sleep in. So my husband and I started like kind of dressing a little bit better from the waist up for the sake of Zoom calls. So they weren't pajamas, but they weren't real clothes. They were pajamas you wore during the day. So we ended up calling them daydjamas. And even though we're out of lockdown, we still call them our day jamas. Not pajamas, not your outside clothes, but your day jamas. And even some friends have uh, picked up on that as well. But on the subject of pajamas, that did lead me to two questions. Number one, it's kind of an unusual word. What's the etymology of the word pajamas? And I'm hoping you can settle something else. My other question, I have seen pajamas spelled with a P-A as well as a P-Y. So I want to know what is the correct spelling of the word pajamas? Anyway, thank you once again. Love your show. Uh, Thanks a bunch. Bye-bye. Thanks for the great call, Fred. As someone who has worked from home for around 20 years, I love to lounge around in pajamas. Pajamas is an interesting word, too. The Oxford English Dictionary says it is, quote, partly a borrowing from Urdu, partly a borrowing from Persian, unquote. In the regions where those languages are spoken, people just wore loose pants tied at the waist. Europeans who lived there around the year 1800 adopted this style, and it seems especially for nightwear, according to Adam Online. The word has two parts. Pay for leg, and jama for clothing. And the first time it appeared in English, it was written as two words, pay jamas. As for the second part of your question, it was spelled a bunch of different ways between 1800 and about 1885, at which point it seemed to settle into the PYJ spelling in British English and the PAJ spelling in American English. I couldn't find any explanation of why it ended up different in different countries. I suspected it could be Noah Webster's doing, but Adam Online puts the American spelling at 1845, and an 1872 edition of Webster's Dictionary didn't have the word at all with either spelling. All I can really say is that it's just one of the odd little differences. So when you ask which spelling is correct, the answer depends on where you live. It's P-A-J-A-M-A-S in American English and P-Y-J-A-M-A-S in British English. And no matter how you spell it, I hope many of you are able to enjoy lounging around in your pajamas or daydjamas a bit more than normal this week. If you want to share the story of your family act, your family dialect, or word your family and only your family uses, call the voicemail line at 833-321-4GIRL. It's in the show notes, and be sure to tell me the story behind your family act, because that's always the best part. Also, it's not too late to start the year with the Grammar Daily. The book is like a -a tip-a-day calendar you get to keep. It has 365 pages with tips, cartoons, puzzles, and quizzes to entertain you for the whole year. The weeks are numbered, one, two, three, and so on, so you can start any time. But I do like to start things like this the first week of the year. It just feels more orderly to me. That's the Grammar Daily. Grammar Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Thanks to marketing associate Davina Tomlin, ad operations specialist Morgan Christensen, director of podcasts Brandon Getches, marketing assistant Cameron Lacey, digital operations specialist Holly Hutchings, and audio engineer Nathan Sims, who says he finally got approval from immigration to bring his fiance to the States. They don't have an official date yet, but it's happening soon, and I just could not be more happy for them. That's such great news. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening.